Welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Good day again. It's nice to see you. You look nice and chirpy today. Oh, you look chirpy too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before we begin and pray and everything, um, maybe you can just explain to us what this, what this is. I don't have. A I haven't got the foggiest idea. I think it's a decoration that uh, they bought to th because it's the same color with this. I don't know. Maybe it's a, a fruit from this pine here. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. I think you can put a candle in there. Yeah, maybe. But, it's so but then this one doesn't have anything on it, so it's just a decoration. But the advantage is that if you put a candle in there, then the candle will be higher than when you put it down there. Yes. So, thank you for that explanation. It's a pleasure. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Will you pray for us now? Thanks. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are living in such troublesome times. The world is on fire, but you want our hearts to be right. And I pray that you will help us and lead us with your Holy Spirit so that we may discern not only the times we live in, but what you would have us be. So help us in our deliberations in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been busy discussing the pillars of Adventism. Yes. And we only got as far as the sanctuary with the previous episode. Correct. So is there any, would you like to carry on and show us what is interesting on... Well, when we looked at uh, this issue, we said there were five pillars of Adventism. Now, last time we discussed the sanctuary doctrine and that there is a sanctuary in heaven and that Jesus went into the holy and then into the, most holy. into the most holy and what the cleansing of the sanctuary uh, meant and all of those issue, issues. I think the doctrine of the second advent, I think we've discussed that quite thoroughly. Yes, I think so. I don't think we have to go into that. And you've given all the links, links is so in. people can study that. The Sabbath, I think we have dealt with, dealt with in quite some detail. The state of the dead, perhaps we can do that at the stage as yes, we well. Can. Spirit of prophecy, we had a whole lecture on that, if I yes. recall. So what else is on this slide? Out of these, the realization emerged of the context of the three angels' messages that had to be preached to the whole world. And the health message was later added because uh, it was considered the right arm of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, this causes... A little bit of perplexity yes. in some people because why should there be a health message associated, you know, with the gospel? So maybe we can talk about that. We can. Bit. If I can just go back to the um, sanctuary doctrine, there was a question yes. about, you mentioned in the lecture, the scapegoat. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked, and I think that's a question that a lot of people actually ask. Who does the, sa the scapegoat represent? Ah, okay. Well, remember there were two goats on the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement in uh, Jewish thinking was the Day of Judgment. Mm. So on that day, they would fast. They would uh, search their souls to see what is inside of them. In other words, they'll do introspection to see whether they are right with God. It was a solemn day. Mm. And on that day, they had to bring two goats. And they cost lots for the goats. And then when the lot was, had determined, one of them became the Lord's goat mm -hmm. and the other one became the scapegoat. Now, the Lord's goat was sacrificed. And the high priest took of that blood into the sanctuary and he went into the most holy. It was a very solemn occasion. And uh, remember they had little bells around the bottom and everybody was listening carefully because in the past it had happened that if someone was careless, mm. 
and they went into the most holy or weren't entitled to be there, they could be struck dead. Mm. So there was a lot of introspection. Am I right with God? And the high priest would go in and he would make atonement for the sanctuary. Now obviously the sanctuary doesn't sin. It's a building, right? Yes. Or it's a structure. Mm. So what kind of atonement? Atonement is, uh, well, let's put it this way. Tyndall put it nicely. He actually coined the phrase. It meant at one moment. Okay. Atonement. Yeah, yeah. At one moment. It's actually a, a word that he made up to explain how God um, associated himself with humanity and became one with them and took the place of and paid the price for as though he were the guilty party, although he wasn't. Yes. And so you, when, you, when they made atonement for the sanctuary, the record of sin was removed. These are all the confessed sins. Now remember, Jesus had already paid the price for those sins, and the price was death. Yes. The wages of sin is death. So the price for those sins has been fully paid. Yeah. In fact, the price for all sin for all of humanity was paid on the cross. Yes. But not everybody appropriates it. Only those who confess their sins and forsake their sins are those sins that are carried into the sanctuary. Now, so the redeemed sins, the record of sin is there. Now that record of sin has to be removed. And this is what happened on the Day of Atonement. So in type, he removed the record of sin. And it started in the Most Holy. Mm. And he sprinkled the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant contained the, the Ten, Ten Commandments, Commandments, which are the standard of God's righteousness and his law. Yes. The Ten Commandments condemned me to death. And so in type, the condemnation is removed. The sin, the recorded sin on the horns of the alt altar is removed as he moves into the holy. The whole structure, everything that dealt with how to deal with the sin, sin issue is basically removed. The record of confessed sin. Yes. And then the high priest would in type place his hands upon the scapegoat mm. and in type the record of confessed sins that had already been atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ yes. was placed on the scapegoat. But the scapegoat doesn't die at that point. Mm. He is led into the wilderness yes. by a strong man <laughs> and then he is let loose. Now what does that entail and who is the scapegoat? Well, the scapegoat was also known as Azazel, mm. which is a symbol of the devil. Mm. So who actually initiated sin in the universe? was the devil. Yes. And who caused man to sin? It was the, the devil, devil that caused man to sin. Now some people cling to sin, and some people are willing to forsake sin. And all those records of, of forsaken, forgiven sins, are placed onto the scapegoat, the real culprit who actually produced those sins. Yes. But he doesn't become the sin bearer no. because he doesn't pay the price for those sins. He doesn't die. He doesn't shed his blood for those sins. Yes. That sin stays on his it head. It stays on his head. Now the beauty of this is that when the record of sin is removed from heaven, then you stand before God as though you had never, never sinned. sinned. So how complete is forgiveness? Complete. It's absolute. Mm -hmm. There is not even a record of sin. It has been removed. Yes. And eventually, when God's retributive action takes place, and humanity in the final judgment comes under the condemnation, and everybody that has decided to cling to their sin 
will pay the price for that sin, yes. which is death. Yes. And fire came out of heaven and consumed them. They shall be ashes under your feet. They were consumed away, says the Bible. Yeah. Like nothing smoke, left. Nothing yes. left. Yes. So everybody that has never confessed their sins will pay the price for those sins. Yes. They could have had redemption because Christ had died for those sins already. But they didn't appropriate them. They didn't want that atonement. Yes, they cling to something for themselves. Exactly, and God doesn't force anyone. Yes. So then you pay the price. But if you have forsaken and confessed your sins and accepted the free gift of Christ's sacrifice, then you don't come into condemnation. Yes. But that record is still there. Mm. And that record has to be removed from heaven. Heaven is a place of sinlessness. Mm. Yes. There's not even a record of sin. So even that is removed and placed upon the scapegoat. And eventually after the millennium, when sin is destroyed and the devil is destroyed as well because the Bible says fire came out of him devouring and consumed him. Yeah. He was gone. So that record together with him is destroyed forever. I think that was very nice and clear. So, so let's let's move on to the the next the health message that you and what can you Yes, people ask that? this question. Why should there be a health message? What has health got to do with the gospel? And uh, the answer is quite a deal. <laughs> so let us go through some of these, these things and see what we can find. When God created Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden, mm. he determined what their diet should be. So if we go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 and it says, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. Now you must remember this is old English. When it says meat, it it's means food. food. Mm. When it says flesh, yes. it means meat, meat as we would <laughs> yeah. say it today. All right, so what was the first diet of man? It was every plant, every herb that bears seed. So that's all your grains and your seeds, which is upon the face of the whole earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. So fruits, grains, nuts, seeds, that was the diet of man. No vegetables. Yes. None. Now what was the diet of the animals? Genesis 1 verse 30 says, And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl. Every is a very big word. You know? Yes. Very that doesn't uh, exclude any. No, it doesn't exclude anything. Every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. So all the green plants. So you have your grazers that graze, you have your browsers that eat leaves. That was the food. Yes, and some had specialized foods. Now we must understand that the antediluvian world was a very, very rich world. And the climate was absolutely perfect. perfect. And uh, uh, the the plants that existed far exceeded in number those that we have today. Mm. I mean, if you take the great oil deposits in the world, the great uh, coal fields in the world, these are all plant materials from the antediluvian world that were destroyed in the, the flood. flood. Yes. Yeah. And if you go into the paleontological record, we find <laughs> myriads of animals and plants that no longer exist. So there were, was a plant for every single animal. Now I once gave a, a lecture called Creation to Restoration. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could put that link in. I'll put the link in. Yes, and we can see how the animal kingdom originally was all plant eating. 
and how we can still find evidence for that today, even in the big carnivores like yeah, the lions, lions. etc. So the Bible says everything ate plants. Mm. That was the diet of man. And it's obvious there was no death. Mm. Death is a consequence of sin. sin yeah. So the plant world was created as food. Now the Bible also says that uh, the, the life is in the blood. Now plants don't have a vascular system. They have other uh, tubular systems, xylem and phloem, etc., etc. But it's not a vascular system. They also don't have a nervous system. Mm. But they are living. They are living food. Mm. Living food. And in Genesis 3 verse 17, there is this statement. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, uh, that's a very interesting verse. I, I don't think we should get into that. We get into trouble if we, if we go down that route. <laughs> and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. So what was cursed? The ground. Yes. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herbs of the field. So after sin came into mm. the world, something was added to the diet, yes. the herbs of the field, which originally were animal food. Mm. Hmm? So in other words, what happened here was vegetables were added. added. All the leafy plants that we eat were added to the diet. Now, why? Obviously, to augment the diet and yes. to supply uh, nutrients. Nutrients, because after the sin, the earth was cursed. cursed. Correct. So, when the earth was cursed, then it didn't bring forth as it did before. And there was also a seasonality. We know that the Bible tells us that the trees, if you take the tree of life, for example, bore fruit once a month. Mm. So that's 12 times a year. We don't have that luxury today. No. So certain fruits are seasonal. And uh, what if you have certain areas where, well, there is no fruit during a certain season, mm. like in Europe, for example, uh, or in the very cold areas, yes. well, then you have to eat the plants of the field. That's the way it is. Now, why was diet so important? Do you remember that diet was the first test? Mm -hmm. You shall not eat of this tree. And it, was, it looked good for food. So why would God make such a rule? And it was, it was a test of faith, right? Yes. So does faith and diet have something to do with each other? I think so. So could it be a test? Mm -hmm. what, yes, I think as we go on, you'll see that it did become a test eventually for a few except for Adam and Eve and a few other places as well. And correct. Now, the, not, the other thing that's interesting is uh, this was the very first thing that created the fall. And when you go to the temptations of Jesus, what was the very first yes. temptation? Turn the stone into bread. Aha. Uh -huh. In other words, where Adam and Eve had all this luxury that surrounded them, mm. the Son of God was in that wilderness and he had been fasting for 40 days. He was emaciated. He was hungry yes. to the point of death. And he was tempted mm. on the issue of diet. And in behalf of humanity, he redeemed Adam's fall. Mm. So diet obviously played a very important role. Exactly, but role. like you said now, in exactly what Adam fell to sin, he overcame not to sin. Correct, absolutely. When we talk about uh, the other one, of course, was uh, the sin of presumption. Mm. Throw yourself down. But we're not going to go yeah, into that. that. That's a whole lecture on the That's own. a lecture of it by itself. Yeah. 
So we read here in the spirit of prophecy, God gave our first parents the food he designed that the race should eat. It was contrary to his plan to have the life of any creature taken. That's obvious. The wages mm -hmm. of sin is death. There was to be no death in Eden. The fruit of the trees in the garden was the food man's wants required. God gave man no permission to eat animal food until after the flood. Everything had been destroyed upon which man could subsist, and therefore the Lord, in their necessity, gave Noah permission to eat of the clean animals. Now this is very important, because people say, you know, clean and unclean doesn't count anymore. Mm. But uh, here we see that clean and unclean existed in Noah's day already, because he had to take seven pairs of clean, and one pair of unclean animals. Yes, uh, usually if you ask people how many of each animal went into the ark, everybody will say two. Yeah, one pair. One pair. Yes. But just mention again, of the unclean, it was a pair. Yes. Of the clean, exactly. much more. So when he brought an offering, because he offered the clean animals at the, when, he, when the flood was over, he couldn't offer the unclean, because that would have destroyed the race, right? Yeah. So, or the kind, in any case. So, clean and unclean is something that existed before the flood. And Noah was specifically told that he wasn't to eat the fat or the blood. Mm. So, no blood, no fat, and nothing that is unclean. Now, people will say, yes, but uh, God declared these things clean when Jesus said, he declares it clean. Now, this is where the, the Bible translations again become interesting. And unfortunately, it just is a fact that the modern translations just don't do justice to what is really said. Uh, in the NIV, for example, it will say that when, when Jesus said, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean, but what comes out of your mouth that makes you unclean. Mm. It says there quite categorically in the new translations in the NIV, hereby Jesus declared all foods clean. clean. Well, if that were the case, are you going to eat uh, poisonous animals that will kill you with one lick? I mean, that's a ridiculous statement. And they will claim, well, Peter had the vision, mm. remember? Yes, so. But uh, what Sheet. was Peter's answer three times when he was told? No. Peter? Go kill and eat, and do not say that is unclean what God has declared clean. While he was sitting there wondering what the vision meant, because he had said, Not so, my Lord, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. So, while he was thinking, there was this knock on the door, and the three men stood there, remember? Yes. And when he came to Cornelius' house, he said, God has shown me. Exactly that I should call no man impure or unclean. It had nothing to do with diet. No. So uh, those rules have been absolutely obliterated by humanity. Mm. Uh, so what were the prohibitions? No fat. No blood. No blood. Nothing unclean mm. in terms of diet. But what was the original diet? Yes. Totally plant-based. Yes. So, if God wanted to restore humanity to the original, uh, well, let's rephrase that. Is God going to restore humanity to the original? Yes. So, what will they have to give up? All these foods that weren't part of the original diet. They will have to be given up. Uh, is it better to do it sooner or later? And was there another issue? Was there a spiritual mm -hmm. issue? And that's what we're going to talk about. Because we're talking about preparation for the Lord's coming. As I said, I believe that the signs are fulfilling around us. I don't, do you feel that? Oh, definitely. Do you, can you see uh, the predictions in the book of Revelation coming to fruition? Can you see the image of the beast forming? Yes. Definitely. We can see all these signs around us. So if all of these things are happening, 
then know that the time is near. So God gave man no permission to eat animal food until after the flood, and we've discussed that. Everything had been destroyed upon which man could subsist, and therefore the Lord in their necessity gave Noah permission to eat of the clean animals which he had taken with him into the ark. But animal food was not the most healthful article of food for man. So, why did God permit this? Well, there was nothing else. And what was the consequence? Well, before the flood, people reached ages of over 900 years. Yes. The very next generation after the flood only reached half of that. Yes. Around 400 and something. And then as you continue down the line, you will see that it became less and less. In the time of Abram, Abram was 180. Yes. By the time you get to Moses, Moses it's 120. Years. By the time you get to David, it's 70. And if you're lucky, you reach 80. And by reason of strength, you might get to be more than that. So animal food was never the most healthful article of food for man purely on a physical basis. But what about the mental basis? And I think that is something that we can look at. So after the flood, people ate largely animal food. God saw that the ways of man were corrupt and that he was disposed to exalt himself proudly against his creator and to follow the inclinations of his own heart. And he permitted that long-lived race to eat animal food to shorten their sinful lives. Actually, that's also a mercy. Soon after the flood, the race began to rapidly decrease in size and in length of years. Mm -hmm. Well, you can check that in the Bible. But the words of our teacher to us were, As a man thinketh so easy. The flesh of dead animals was not the original food for man. Man was permitted to eat it after the flood because all vegetation had been destroyed. But the curse pronounced upon man on earth and every living thing has made strange and wonderful changes. Since the flood, the human race has been shortening its period of existence, physical, mental, moral degeneracy is rapidly increasing in these latter days. Uh, that is a fact. I mean, I've been around for more than a generation. I'm heading for the second generation. <laughs> and even I can say that in my lifetime, I've seen massive changes mm. in terms of moral degeneracy amongst mankind. Yes. I mean, what was absolutely abhorred in the past is now mm. legislation. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm afraid if it carries on like this, it, all these things will become compulsory. <laughs> 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 so we said that the, the animal kingdom and humanity will be restored to the original. Does the Bible tell us that? It's the evident. answer is yes. Isaiah 11 verse 6. And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, so there will be no more predation. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. In other words, no aggression. You don't have to be afraid. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion will become a vegetarian. Mm. He will eat straw like the ox. So what kind of straw he will eat? We don't know. What was the original grass form? Reed, perhaps? Mm. Because we do have carnivores that eat reeds, yes. like panda bears, panda, yeah. for example. So maybe there was a specific uh, reed or grass kind that was lion food that required those shearing teeth to shred it, like uh, the panda bear yeah. in his case. But then there's this interesting verse 11, Isaiah 11, verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall send, set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Patros and from Cush and from Elah 
and from Shina and from Hamad and from the islands of the sea. So now he's going to a universal scale. And he says, God is going to gather his people a second time. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. God is going to call a people at the end of time and he's going to bring them into a relationship with himself. Now, what did he do when he called Israel out of Egypt? Put them on a diet. Aha. Uh -huh. So he put them on a road of experiential learning. Mm -hmm. And diet was an integral part of that event. So when God took the children of Israel out of Egypt and he brought them into this relationship with himself, he was intent on training them to become Eden-minded again. Yes. Uh, they were very charmed with that, right? <laughs> no. So when God gathers the people universally for the second time, do you think he might follow a, a similar process? Or will he say, well, it didn't work the first time. I'm going to leave that one out. Mm. I don't think so. And are the people going to feel differently than the, they felt when they came out of Egypt about this new way that God, or this way that God wants them to? Well, when God calls people, he calls all kinds of people, doesn't he? Yes. But it's a good question. I, I think you have an ulterior motive. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when he calls them out and he brings them into this relationship, uh, were they all Holy people, wonderful people when he called them out? No. Mm -hmm. There were also others amongst them which were called the mixed multitudes. Yes. And there was always strife and argument. And we can have a similar situation. God calls all kinds of people. The gospel net catches all kinds of fish. And they're brought into the gospel net. But the sorting of the fish is God's business and mm. not my business. So God will one day sort the bad fish from the good fish and he will sort the good grain from the tears. Yes, from the tears, etc. So let's have a look because people sometimes will claim, oh, you Adventists, you make health such a big issue. Mm. But why is it a big issue? And let's get a biblical basis for this, because it really is biblical. So what did God do when he led the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt? Let's have a look at the Exodus. Exodus 16, verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Hmm. And the children of Israel said unto them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots. Now this is not meat, meat. right? This is flesh. And when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, diet was associated with law. Yes. Now, when the bread fell, the manna, of course, on a Friday there was a double portion. On the Sabbath there was none. Mm -hmm. And some of them would try and go and gather it on the, on the Sabbath, but there was none. Yes. And if they gathered more than they should on the other days, then it became rotten. Yes. Now, what was the lesson in that? The manna, of course, was the literal food, but it had a spiritual application pointing to a higher food, the bread that came down from heaven, yes. namely Jesus Christ and his character. And that 
internalization, this study of the character of God is a daily. Yes. I cannot uh, hoard and gorge myself in that for a day and then go without it because I feel that I've had enough. Mm. No, I need a daily experience with God. And so it was a test of obedience, whether they would recognize the Sabbath. And remember, this was before Sinai. Yes. So the law had not yet been given. And it came to pass that on the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So by a singular miracle, God drilled the Sabbath into their minds. Yes. Important, right? Definitely. Okay. Now that was the type. Don't you think when God gathers the people out of the world for the second time, that he will do the same? Yes. That he will draw this concept of the Sabbath into the minds of men? Therefore, on the sixth day, there will be none. You have to have prepared yourself. You have to have the preparation before that. And then you must concentrate on the Sabbath day. And there will be twice as much, so you won't starve. No. God will take care of you on the Sabbath day. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat. And in the morning, bread to the full. Now, why did he give them flesh? Because they were murmuring for it. Aha. Uh -huh. He didn't originally give it to them. No. But they got fed up with the kind of food that they were getting. And so they murmured. Because you murmured against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord, because who instigated this rule? It was God. Yes. God wanted to take them back to an uh, Edenic diet and an Edenic mindset. Verse 12 says, And I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, says God now, At even you shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. I'll give you what you want. The bread is from me, the other one is because of your murmuring. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years, until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. Well, if you're in America, you say manna, right? <laughs> now why? Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So, diet associated with God's word. Yes. And if diet has a role to play in your association with the word, then it must have an important part to play in discernment. Yes. And we have to get into the bottom of to the bottom of this. When he gave them meat, he gave them another specific instruction. In Numbers eleven eighteen he says, And say unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. That's a fascinating statement. Contemplate your standing with God and see that you are right with God and whether you are in God's will. And then you shall eat flesh. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Can we expect the people in the second gathering to have similar sentiments? Now you are conjecturing something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can only give my own experience. I was probably the biggest meat eater on the planet. 
uh, chicken to me was a vegetable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steak was was meat, was flesh, right? Well, that's the South African view of oh. chicken. <laughs> it's vegetable. <laughs> it's definitely a vegetable. <laughs> So it was very, very strange to me to see a people trying to live on a plant-based diet. I thought it was totally insane. Mm. And when I studied it, uh, I became even more convicted that they were insane. <laughs> yeah. But then when I studied the Word of God, and that little voice started speaking to me, and then, of course, the experience, the sicknesses that came with it, the frequent uh, uh, colds, the, the flus, the ear infections, the throat infections, the sinus infections, all of these things, uh, the high blood pressure, all of these issues. Then I started realizing that God's way is the better way. And it is a tremendous adjustment. Mm, yes. But uh, this is what we are all like. And some will yield it, and some won't. So God said to them, You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it come out of your nostrils and it is loathsome unto you. I think he's trying to make a point, don't mm. you? <laughs> yes. Because you have despised the Lord which is amongst you and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? So was God pleased with their meat eating? Yes or no? Flesh eating? According to this, no. Absolutely not. Was he going to teach them a lesson? He said so. Numbers 21 verse 5, And this people spoke against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. Our soul loathes this light bread. In other words, it wasn't heavy on the stomach. Mm. It must have been very good for them. But they loathed it. They wanted something substantial. Mm. And uh, you know, <laughs> man, in particular, is that way inclined. He wants something substantial, not this bread, <laughs> light green, green stuff. stuff. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> Numbers eleven thirty-two. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. And he that gathered least gathered ten homers. That's about a bathful. Yeah, 200 liters about. Yeah. And they spread them all abroad for themselves around about the camp. And while the... F now this is interesting. While the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, mm -hmm. the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. God was obviously not pleased with their disposition, right? And he called the name of that place Kibrot Hatava, Graves of Longing, because there they buried the people that lusted. The Spirit of Prophecy actually tells us that they were so gluttonous that they couldn't even wait to, to be properly cooked, mm. nor properly prepared, and that they just started eating it like like crazy. And some, of course, were more gluttonous than others. It's also interesting when you study the word gluttony, mm. you will find in, in the scripture, especially in the writings of Solomon, that it's particularly associated with meat eating, mm. flesh eating. So some of them were more so than others, and they, of course, were the first ones to actually suffer the consequences. Now verse 6 had said, now our soul is dried away. That's interesting. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. So something happens inside when you start desiring foods that are not good for you. Mm. 
Verse 31 says, And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. So here they were, just sitting. And some people say, well, you know what, this was not a miracle. This was just something that happened at that time of year. The, the winds brought the birds and they sat down and the people ate this, but God did this twice. Yes. The first time he was more lenient with them. He told them he was displeased. But the second time is when he sent the plague. Yes. So obviously God wanted them to learn a lesson, but many of them refused to learn the lesson. And Psalms gives us a little bit of an inkling here. Psalms 106 verse 14. But they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. This is, this is uh, like Hebrew parallelism. Mm. So the lusting is associated with tempting God. In other words, you're going against God's will. best will for you. Uh, verse 15 says, and he gave them their request. Mm. But then this amazing verse here, but sent leanness into their soul. Something happened in here. A leanness, an emptiness. emptiness. Mm. So has it to do with discernment? So can obedience in terms of diet affect your spirituality? You know, I, I always so. found it fascinating because I was associated with the occult world and uh, I studied a lot about occultism when I was a pagan and my father-in-law was deeply involved and he actually trained me in many many things and uh, we all ate meat of course but when he wanted to be on a different spiritual level, when he wanted to have a particular spiritual experience, he would go vegetarian. And if you read the occult writings, you will see that many of the high Luciferians are actually vegetarians. And uh, many of the leaders in the world are vegetarians. So even in the occult world, Spirituality can be associated with your diet. Mm. Yes. Yeah, because Satan, the father of all this, knows Absolutely. that your diet has to do with your spirituality. Absolutely. And your spirituality can be on the side of the Luciferian doctrine or it can be on the side of the biblical doctrine. Yes. Now, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6 says, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust of the evil things as they also lusted. What did they lust after? After the after flesh, the flesh meats. It's interesting to me that flesh in the Bible is a symbol of the un unsanctified nature. And the manna symbolizes the sanctified nature. Here's another quote that I found fascinating. During this period of waiting, there was time for them to meditate upon the law of God which they had heard and to prepare their hearts to receive the further revelations that he might make to them. They had none too much time for this work. And had they been thus seeking a clearer understanding of God's requirements and humbling their hearts before him, they would have been shielded from temptation. But they did not do this. And they soon became careless, inattentive, lawless. Especially was this the case with the mixed multitude. They were impatient to be on their way to the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. It was only on condition of obedience that the goodly land was promised them, but they had lost sight of this. There were some who suggested a return to Egypt. But whether forward to Canaan or backward to Egypt, the masses of the people were determined to wait no longer for Moses. So, isn't it interesting 
that your understanding will be affected. Mm. You know, I find uh, the story of Herod and John the Baptist very interesting. Yes. Because Herod actually, according to the scripture, was very interested in what John the Baptist had to say. Yes. And in fact, Manaean, his uh, stepbrother, accepted what John the Baptist said and joined the church. Mm. And Herod actually changed many things in his life. But when Herodias couldn't get her away, she organized a tremendous feast. Mm. And there was lots of wine and everything that gratified the appetite. And when under those beclouded conditions, suddenly his discernment was gone. And he did things which he would not normally do. Yes. And he sentenced him to death yes. on the request of Herodias through Salome. So diet can so becloud your attention and your mind that it can cost you your eternal life. Mm. Psalm 78 verse 18 says, And they tempted God in their hearts by asking meat for their lust. Psalms 106 verse 14 and 15, They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, tempted God, and he gave them their request, but this leanness in the soul, this emptiness in the heart. So when they walked according to the counsel of God, what happened? Psalms 105 verse 37 says, He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person amongst their tribes. Yeah. Healthy. What a beautiful promise. Mm. And here's another quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. The light that God has given and will continue to give on the food question is to be to his people today what the manna was to the children of Israel. So we do have a test. Yes. God does not change. It says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and, and forever. forever. So when he gathered them and he put them on that lifestyle, when he gathers them out of the world, out of every nation, tribe and people, he's going to do the same. And we're going to have the same consequences. Now, one interesting story in the Bible that tells us what discernment is and what diet, what role diet plays is the story of Daniel. The character of Daniel is presented to the world as a striking example of what God's grace can make of men fallen by nature and corrupted by sin. The record of his noble self-denying life is an encouragement to our common humanity. From it we may gather strength to nobly resist temptation and firmly and in the grace of meekness stand for the right under the severest trials. Those who make the most of their opportunities, who place themselves in right relation with God, will be rewarded even as, as was Daniel. We read of him. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. That's the king's food. Mm. Nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king. Mm. In other words, he was under the impression that the king's food was the best. Yes. And here Daniel said, no, no it's not want the it. best. And it came to a test. For why should I see your face worse liking than the children which are of your sort? So here were the exiles. They were all Israelites. Yes. That's an important point, isn't yes. it? Yes. A lot of people miss that. Yes. The first test was Daniel and his friends against his kin. Exactly. Now, what was the mindset of the eunuch? The food that the king had supplied was the best. Mm. And Daniel said, it's not the best. And he was horrified. So today, if you decide to become a vegetarian, there will be many a voice which says, where are you going to get your protein from? Yes. And what about B12? Mm. 
and what about this and what about that? And you're going to get weak. The strongest person on the planet is a vegan, vegetarian. The best athletes are vegetarians. In fact, if you want to compete on, on that level in the world today, you had best be a vegetarian. And uh, I mean, this is common knowledge. And we could show lots of those uh, <laughs> interesting videos, but it's just a fact. The mindset of man just cannot comprehend that flesh and plant should have such a different reaction. Now, my own research was animal protein versus plant protein and the effect on the diseases and the health of, of humanity. That was what I did at university. And it always stunned me that if you put in that plant protein combination, a grain and a legume is a complete protein. So yes. a simple thing like a peanut butter sandwich is a complete protein. Yes. And a better protein that you could ever get out of, out of flesh. And if you compared the, the parameters, the immune responses, the uh, cardiovascular responses, the cholesterol levels, all of these things with plant-based versus non-plant-based, I mean, the differences were always astounding. Mm -hmm. So he thought that he would be worse off if he changed his diet. Then you shall make me endanger my head to the king. And Daniel said to him, Prove thy servant, I beseech thee ten days. Daniel said, And let them give us pulse to eat. That's plant material, mm. vegetarian. And water to drink. I don't want this wine. And let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. He was being compared within the Israelite community. Yes. So today we have people that have accepted the call and there are those that stubbornly refuse to follow the Lord's directives and those that follow it. And if you compare them, well, those comparisons have been made. The World Health Organization has made comparisons like that. And the World Health Organization years ago already published that if your diet is more plant-based, then you are healthier than if it is less plant-based. Then let our countenance be looked on before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. Mm. Do a test, a 10-day test. Do you think 10 days can do it? I mean, definitely. Well, it doesn't seem logical. Well, we have institutes, health institutes mm -hmm. today, that put you on a 10-day diet. And within 10 days, the parameters are so vastly changed mm. that the people that are part of this are stunned. I have seen with my own eyes people that cannot even walk mm -hmm. five meters without having to sit down, they're in such a state, at the end of 10 days, be transformed. Yes. Unbelievable. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children, these are the children of Israel, which did eat the portions of the king's meat. And we can confirm that today. Um, just two questions that I would like to ask on Daniel. The first is the wine that he didn't want to drink. Yes. Can you elaborate on that for us? And then also, there's also mentioning that the food was offered to idols. Uh -huh. Well, he came from the royal family, right? Mm. He, was, he was a prince. And uh, wine had been forbidden for the priesthood. Now, people obviously drank wine and uh, throughout history, and even Noah got drunk. So uh, there's no doubt that people drank alcoholic beverages. And the priesthood was forbidden to do this. And 
Daniel had purposed in his heart that he did not want to defile himself with these issues. Now today, aren't God's people called the royal priesthood? Mm -hmm. And uh, the wine that Jesus uh, produced out of water is at the wedding of in Cana. That could not have been alcoholic, because if the bread was to be unleavened, which was a symbol of sin, mm -hmm. then the wine also would have to be unleavened. And Jesus spoke about uh, putting wine, new wine, into old wine skins that they would burst. Yes. In other words, why would they burst? Because the bacteria that caused the fermentation are inside the old wine skin and would cause a fermentation which would then make, then make them burst. So in other words, they were preserved so that they would not ferment. And it's also interesting that Jesus didn't ask for the wine jugs to be filled to fill with them water. Up. He asked for the ritual cleansing stone uh, containers outside where you, you washed your hands and your feet, which was a, a, a symbol of cleansing, mm. that those should be filled with water because he would give you a higher cleansing, that of his blood. And the difference between alcoholic wine and just normal fruit juice, yes. I've actually seen if the Bible talks negatively about the wine, then it's... You have to get it out of the context. Yes. Because the word is the same. It's grape juice or it is fermented. Yeah. So obviously when the Bible talks about uh, pouring wine, woe to him who gives wine, to drinks, wine drink to his neighbor, uh, then it's alcoholic. And when it is talking about new wine or wine, you have to get it from the context yeah. whether it is fermented or so unfermented. drinking wine and be merry is not but they are showing to alcoholic No, wine. definitely not. Haven't we come together and had uh, grape juice together and were merry? Certainly. It doesn't have to be alcoholic. No. In the old days, it used to be alcoholic in my life and I paid the price. That's the thing. You see, if, you, if you're a drinker and you drink and, they, and you drink a little bit and you call it tipsy, you become tipsy, you think it's being merry. But somebody doesn't, that doesn't drink at all, don't think you're merry, you think, think you're, you're drunk. <laughs> you're drunk and, and you're yeah. acting stupid, correct, yes. So Daniel was a type of the people of the end. Daniel, the name actually means judgment. Mm. And he was temperate in his ways and he was vegetarian. He didn't eat the flesh foods and he abstained from alcoholic beverages. Mm. Let's go to John the Baptist, who's another type. Sorry, just the other one, the, uh, the food, idols, the, the food, food. Sacrifice to yes. idols. Now, that, that is a, a, an interesting point, because even the Council of Jerusalem confirmed that you shouldn't eat food sacrificed to idols. Mm. Now, uh, basically, what happened in the old days is the pagans would dedicate the food to their gods and the disciples felt that you should not eat that mm. kind of food. Paul later on clarifies it somewhat when Paul says uh, an idol is nothing, it, it doesn't really exist. So he makes a statement which is often misconstrued, he said therefore if your faith is weak you will eat only vegetables because the meat was generally sacrificed to idols. Now, uh, even in today's world, some religious systems mm -hmm. will bless the food in a particular way mm -hmm. and then the food gets stamped as being blessed in a particular way. In fact, even with the medications it is done like mm -hmm. that. Many homeopathic medicines, for example, you have uh, a chanting which takes place to enforce uh, the vitality of the medication. Mm. So that is also dedicated, as you were, to another entity. Now Paul says if your faith is weak, 
then you will avoid all of those things. But if your faith is strong, then you will know that an idol is nothing, it doesn't exist. So can you, can you then eat it or not? Well, Paul says, uh, if your faith is weak, you will avoid it. So it was dedicated to idols. Hmm. And Paul says, if your faith is strong, then it shouldn't bother you. Because you pray over it and you don't worry about it. So if we use modern examples of foods that are dedicated to other deities and have stamps on them which say that they are dedicated to other deities, if my faith is weak, I might avoid them if I do not consider this as, as uh, you know, biblically correct. But if my faith is strong and there's a stamp, let's say, on a bottle of herbs, I know it's herbs. Mm. And I will say to God, thank you for these herbs. Please bless my food and I will eat it because my faith is strong. So it has nothing to do mm. with uh, flesh meats necessarily. Uh, it's also interesting that the council in Jerusalem had said, because Moses has been preached. Uh, in fact, the, the slaughtering ways were already introduced because many people realized the health benefits of this. And even today, I mean, if you take kosher meat, which is meat that has been slaughtered according to the mm. Jewish ritual, and you take halal meat, it has been slaughtered according to the same ritual. Mm. So, uh, in the case of halal meat, there will be an imam who blesses the food as well. So you have that extra dimension. But the, the, the slaughtering technique is actually identical. The blood is drained. So are you not going to eat the one if you are going to eat meat now, uh, as opposed to the other one? Is it because of the dedication or is it because of the way in which it was slaughtered? Mm. So that, that is the issue that people have a problem with. John the Baptist, Matthew eleven eighteen. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a devil. A fascinating verse. Mm. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. So John the Baptist came not eating and drinking. Well, obviously he was eating and drinking something or yes. else he would have died. But he wasn't eating the common foods. Hmm. Jesus, on the other hand, was not sinning. He was without sin. Hmm. But within strict temperate rules, he did not consider it a sin to associate with publicans and sinners whom he came to save. Hmm. And he would eat at their tables, not in, in a fashion which was contrary to the law, but to reach the people where they were. Mm. But his representative came not eating or drinking. And we read in the Spirit of Prophecy, John separated himself from friends and from the luxuries of life, the simplicity of his dress. I mean, Jesus referred to that. What did you see in the desert? Did you see a reed blowing in the wind? No. You saw a prophet. And more than a prophet. Yes. A garment woven of camel's hair was a standing rebuke to the extravagance and display of the Jewish priests. By the way, it was not a skin. Mm, no, it wasn't. It was a garment. It yes. was woven from camel's hair. Beautiful. Yeah. His diet purely vegetable? It's a very strange statement. Of locusts and wild honey. So obviously here she understood that this word locust, locusta, referred to the carob bean. Yeah. And the carob bean was what the poorer people actually ate. It was actually pulse. very healthy food. It was a pulse, yes, mm. carob bean. Uh, the, the last son, he started eating what was given to the pigs by the rich people. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, the same today. I was once in Germany and uh, 
that was years ago. Today it's different. They eat corn on the cob. Mm -hmm. But in those days, they considered corn to be something that was to be fed to the pigs. <laughs> so one of them said, I will only eat corn once it's gone through the pig. In other words, <laughs> while it, once it's been transferred into flesh of the pig. So this is the same case here. So his diet was purely vegetable, consisting of locusta, the carob bean, and wild honey, which, by the way, is a plant product. Yes. Because it's nectar, and it it's, doesn't go into the stomach of the bee. There's a special chamber where it is transferred into honey. So it, it's not something that is pre-digested. Okay. So it is basically plant-based. And it was a rebuke to the indulgence of appetite and the gluttony that everywhere prevailed. Now remember, in those terms, gluttony was mainly referred to flesh-eating. And those who are to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ are represented by faithful Elijah as John came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way of Christ's first advent. The great subject of reform is to be agitated. Temperance in all things is to be connected with the message to turn the people of God from their idolatry, their gluttony and their extravagance in dress and other things. In other words, when you become a Christian, everything has to change. Mm. You have to go back to the Edenic thinking. Now, there's this notion that when you give up the ways of the world, that you are somehow deprived. Oh, had we died in Egypt. And yes, in the beginning, you feel deprived. Yeah. But as you start to learn about the varieties of things that God has given, all the grains that we find in the world, all the ways and means in which you can make the most delightful foods, the del most delightful healthy milks from seeds and nuts, and how you can create uh, the most magnificent dishes using plant-based material. Once your expertise improves, then you cannot even imagine, at least I can't, that I used to live like I yes. used to live. Yes, wow. I was the same. You were a, you were a big meat eater, oh, yes. weren't you? Three times a day. Three times a day? And it's interesting what you're saying now. It's, also, it's almost as if God, you perceive that God always wants you to have, everything He wants you to do is, oh, it's... Inferior yeah, it's to what bad. the world does. I, and everything Satan brings towards you, ah, oh, this is the life, you know, the eating, drinking, whatever I like. So it's something that has to change in your mind. And how do you feel once you've made that change? It takes, a, it takes hard work. But I cannot believe that I once didn't eat like we are eating at this Would stage. Would you want to go back to your original never. lifestyle? No, never. I think I would, I, I would die just of the thought. Yeah. So something has to happen here. And uh, once you've made those changes, once you've said, okay, God, I know this is your will. This is hard for me. I understand that it's hard, but help me. Do you think it'll help you? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. And he'll send things across your path and he'll send uh, recipes and some things that you start experimenting with. I remember my wife, she was in tears because I said, I, I can't live like this. Something has to happen. And eventually I came to the point, I said, okay, okay, let's just take a step back. Let's just have good bread, healthy spreads and fruits until we figured this thing out. Because the taste, you couldn't, at the, in the beginning, yes. that's one of the, the, the things that... Your palate has yeah, to change. Your whole palate has to change because everything doesn't, it's unfamiliar tastes. So, so God doesn't want any drug in your life. Mm -hmm. Nothing that affects your mind. No alcohol. Mm. Because that affects your discernment. Yes. I mean, that's obvious that it affects your discernment, right? Because yep. your inhibitions go. What does that mean? It means anything can tempt you, right? Yeah, and I used to I, I used to drink. And you would always say, yeah, but I don't drink to get drunk. 
and I know when I'm drunk. I, the proof is in the pudding. Yes. You don't actually know. Somebody that's not drinking, he knows. Correct. The yes. person that drinks, even if you drink one drink, you, can, you already have a change and once, you don't even realize it. I once had to attend a, a beach party. I was uh, in a situation where I couldn't get out of it. It was a family situation and there was a massive beach party on the go. And I was the only one not drinking. Absolutely the only one. They were all, <laughs> oh, oh. They were all smashed, mm. right? And I was sitting there and the conversation, <laughs> you know, it drifts from the top to the bottom. <laughs> and the conversation was at a level where I thought, my goodness, and the contrast becomes so great. Mm. And I was sitting there and watching the people and this one lady, she was very drunk and she was walking around making all kinds of statements and then she walked into the sea and there were only tiny little waves. It was a very calm day with tiny little waves and uh, a, a small little wave came and knocked over and I watched and she didn't come up. She didn't come up. And I thought to myself, now, is she playing a game? What is she doing? And then I thought to myself, no, this is not a game. And I was fully dressed. I had clothes on. I was the only one that didn't have a beach attire on. And I ran into the ocean and f where she was and I felt run and there she was. She was lying on the bottom and I picked her up. Now, it wasn't very long because I realized very quickly yeah. and I dragged her out and she was coughing and spluttering and she didn't even know mm. that I had taken her out of the water. And then she got up and walked back to the bar and continued doing what she was doing before. I don't know what happened to her in her life, but uh, I just thank God that I was sober that day. Yeah. So these things, your discernment goes and... Uh, it's very important that we, that we understand that. So what about things like coffee? There's a little video which says what one cup of coffee can do to you. Yes. And in the spirit of prophecy, we read that we shouldn't be drinking those things. It's the most popular drug in the world. I need that little um, boost. It's everywhere, from 320 milligrams in a Starbucks Cafe Grande, about the max you should have in a day, to energy drinks, to sodas, now even inhalable, 100 milligrams in an instant. But could that daily dose of caffeine be changing your brain? We turn to researchers at Wake Forest in North Carolina, where I underwent two MRI brain scans this first scan with no caffeine in my system. Then I downed just one drink. Now my second MRI. This was my brain before caffeine. This was after. The difference was remarkable. It's like a 40% drop in the blood flow to your brain. So that's a lot. So before caffeine, with caffeine, the blood flow to my brain dropped Went about 40%. 40%. Really? Yes. Why the drop? Caffeine blocks a chemical called adenosine, which controls blood flow to the brain. Add caffeine, blood vessels constrict, less blood circulates in the brain, and your blood pressure and heart rate go up. So if you skip your regular coffee, that surging blood can trigger a caffeine headache. It's like trying to get a fire hose to pump blood up through your skull. If you're a caffeine lover, your brain has actually changed. It now functions normally on caffeine. How much caffeine do I have to drink to change the physiology of my uh, brain? Not very much. Not very much? No. Like even a cup One of cup day? One cup a day will change your brain. So in other words, anything that affects your mind should not go into your, into your mouth. So isn't that amazing? One cup and the cup of coffee. One cup of coffee. And there's a 40% reduction in the blood flow to your brain. 
that means that uh, there must be a reduction also in your frontal lobe capacity. You might be more alert, but you don't have the same discernment because of the way in which the blood is channeled. When the Spirit of Prophecy has these quotations in it, they are based on biblical criteria. Here's a very interesting one. There's no safety in eating the flesh of dead animals. And in a short time, the milk of cows will also be excluded from the diet of God's commandment-keeping people. In a short time, it will not be safe to use anything that comes from the animal creation. And today we know that uh, diseases are transferred from animal to animal. Mm -hmm. In the old days, swine flu was swine flu. Bird flu was bird flu. Horse flu was horse flu. Foot and mouth disease happened to cloven hoofed animals, right? Not anymore. Mm. So we have had trans-specific transfer. We call those zoonotic diseases. And they have just increased dramatically. And even if we take the pandemic that is sweeping the world, mm. And if you want to accept that this is a virus that occurred in the animal kingdom, then it is a, a zoonotic transfer, mm. if you want to accept that. So she says, we cannot now do as we have ventured to do in the past in regard to meat eating. It has always been a curse to the human family, but now it is made particularly so in the curse which God has pronounced upon the herds of the fields because of man's transgression and sin. This does not say that wild animals are more clean than caged animals. No, and uh, it's also interesting that uh, in many areas there are um, prohibitions on hunting because of the various diseases that we find in wild animals these days. So it doesn't matter how good you look after your own stock, uh, livestock. No. According to this, the curse which God had pronounced upon the herds of the field. Now, when it comes to viral diseases, uh, they will affect a creature whether it is uh, a healthy receiving healthy food or not let's say free range animals uh, viral diseases these zoonotic diseases they will hit those animals whether they are eating healthy food or not the way the animal deals with it is a different thing so if we have a healthy lifestyle we can deal with diseases in a better fashion, but that doesn't mean that I want to eat an animal that can be a viral carrier. You can be a carrier without any symptoms, for example. So it's best to avoid these things. Now some statements seem a little bit stronger than others, but in the light of what Daniel's experience was, and he did not want to defile himself with what was on the king's table, and he was to set an example mm. And this was an example amongst God's people, right? And, and just take, for example, uh, when they had to bow down to the image yes. that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. How many Israelites were in that group? And only three yes. of them did not bow down. The rest. That's scary, isn't it? That's very scary. That's very scary. And it's always interesting to me that Daniel said, I do not want to defile myself with the food that comes from the king's table. And as we saw, the eunuch thought that that was the very best of food. Food, yeah. But Daniel realized it was the very worst of food. Mm. Now, when you go through uh, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, and uh, you study their their apostasy, for example, yeah. and their life cycles. Even those that died of natural causes, they died very early. Obviously, yeah. they were very diseased. And those that followed God's principles had the opportunity to become very aged. 
So here's this interesting statement. Let not any of our ministers set an evil example in the eating of flesh meat. Let them and their families live up to the light of health reform. We should all be little Daniels. Mm. Let not our ministers animalize their own nature in the nature of their children. Children whose desires have not been restrained are tempted not only to indulge in the common habits of intemperance, but to give loose rein to their lower passions and to disregard purity and virtue. What you eat is what you think. Yes. And what you think is what makes you're... up your character. Yes, what you are. These are led on by Satan not only to corrupt their own bodies, but to whisper their evil communications to others. If parents are blinded by sin, they will often fail to discern these things. Now, what does the spirit of prophecy tell us about coffee? What then? They visited with their brethren and at the table revealed their principles by eating meat and drinking tea and coffee. These men were not making that progress in divine things that would make them safe teachers. So as we discussed, any, any drink or food that contains a narcotic and caffeine is a narcotic. Yes. Affects your mind. According to Wikipedia, it's the only unregulated narcotic drug. drug. Only, yes, you're absolutely right. It's the only unregulated narcotic in the world. And uh, in fact, people can't do without it. The first thing they reach for is that in the morning. Mm. Now, there are so many things that you can drink. I mean, there are so many herbal teas that you can drink. There are so many delightful things that you can do. You don't have to have a, a narcotic blended with your drink to affect your mind. An interesting statement is this one. At this stage of the earth's history, meat eating is dishonoring to God. It is obvious that God took the children of Israel and led them to think in the Edenic fashion. And God will take the people at the end and will do exactly the same thing. It affects your mind, it affects your thinking, it affects your temperance, and it affects your mood irritability, all of those hormones, those, those fear hormones are in that product. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to an abattoir. Have you been to an abattoir? Yes, when I was younger. Now, I used to work in them, of course, because that was <laughs> the nature of my research. And to see this fear in these animals, and all of those, those hormones that uh, tend to create the fight and flight mechanism and all of those cortisones that are released, those are all issues that affect your, your temperament. Mm. And particularly if you have an aggressive nature, you should avoid those kinds of things. So it is not unreasonable to say that these meat eating and liquor drinking that are making the world as it was in the days of Noah. I find it interesting that now, with the, uh, the lockdown being slowly downgraded, liquor drink drinking was again introduced. Mm -hmm. And you see these videos of this a massive excess, that they're downing bottles of brandy as though it were water. And I think to myself, this is what humanity is all about. Where are the Daniels in this world? How many people will now die from accidents mm. because of the use of alcohol? It's dishonoring to God. There's no doubt about it. These things are strengthening the lower passions of the human being, animalizing the race. By giving way to base passions, man is corrupting body, soul, and spirit. The murders committed by men under the influence of strong drink shows what a cruel satanic spirit strong drink inspires in man. Often the liquor sold is adulterated, particularly in this day and age as well. We read about it regularly. Mm. And poisoned, and those who drink it are made mad. It affects your mind. 
Under its influence they show satanic ferocity. They place themselves under Satan's control and he works through them. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So the health message that is so central to Adventism doesn't mean that every Adventist is a health reformer. In fact, uh, the majority are probably kicking against the goads. <laughs> but there is a blessing in it. And as for me, I can only say that uh, the blessing that I've received from a changed lifestyle is beyond computation. Definitely. Same here. Energy levels. Just on that part, it's amazing already that usually when I was sitting behind the desk working for five, six hours, sitting and fishing there behind my computer, <laughs> now I've never had that problem for the past I five years. I used to have that. I used to lie there on the floor sometimes uh, at the university and just say, oh, I wish I could just clear my mind. And that dullness is gone. And the blessings that one receives, as you say, the energy. I'm not, I'm not the youngest person on the planet, but I can still run up a mountain. And many of my colleagues who are much younger than me are, are dead. Mm. They died of cardiovascular disease or whatever. I mean, you can be hit by a bus tomorrow and you can be dead. That is true. But the clarity of yes, mind. That's what I also would like to say. It's not that um, it's only the health. No. That's a, a plus. So there are physical benefits. There are spiritual benefits. And there are temperament benefits. And if you put them all into a package, then the health message is one of the greatest blessings that God has given humanity. It was there in the beginning. It will be there in the end. There was a test of obedience mm -hmm. on appetite in the beginning. Christ paid a tremendous price to overcome that weakness in man's behalf. And that power to overcome, he makes available to God's children. But we have to say yes. And therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Yes, Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us such beautiful truths. Please bless us with these truths and help us to implement it into our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, click here. Thank you again and see you next time.